Good morning and welcome to the MPG Primer for today. Uh, today are, we are very fortunate to welcome Dr. Joshua Dempster as our speaker. Josh has been a staff scientist in cancer data science here at Broad for five years, where his research focuses on analyzing and interpreting genetic perturbation experiments. Before arriving at Broad, he completed his PhD in physics, making him one of the many physicists now working in computational biology. Josh has kindly agreed to answer questions throughout the talk, um, and so I encourage everyone to post questions as they arise in the Q&A, and I will voice those uh, throughout the talk. Um, and so I think we can get started. Uh, please go ahead when you, when you like, Josh. All right. Thanks, Diane. As Diane said, I sort of specialize in how to model and interpret genetic perturbation data. So this is really a talk about a method for um, sort of analyzing the data that might come out of a um, typically an in vitro experiment. Um, so I'll go through sort of uh, what Kronos is, how the, the model kind of works in, in broad outline, um, and then go through a bunch of sort of metrics we can use to compare it to uh, the uh, sort of standard palette of existing models that are used for this problem. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit in more detail about how Kronos differs from the model that uh, DepMap had been previously using for um, the big Project Achilles CRISPR data set that we publish every quarter. Um, just in order to, to give some sense of kind of what has changed uh, with the introduction of Kronos, and then just summarize. And as Diane said, um, everyone should feel free to, to ask questions uh, throughout. I think it just would make the, the talk more interesting. So uh, the specific kind of experiment I have in mind is, is kind of a, a bog standard CRISPR gene knockout experiment. So you have, um, We'll assume that these are, um, you know, cells belonging to a, a single cell line uh, for a given well. You have some pooled library of CRISPR reagents. Uh, maybe it's genome wide, or maybe it's a specific set of genes that you're interested in, and you're going to uh, infect the cells with uh, with these reagents, um, hopefully generating a, a knockout of the gene function in, in each infected cell, and then you pass it to the cells for a while, and then at the end you're gonna um, lice the, the cells and uh, count basically the number of barcodes from your initial infection and, and look at their relative abundance uh, with the idea that you're going to detect uh, genes that have either a positive or negative effect on cell viability when they're knocked out. And the way in which you would um, sort of like the, or the most naive way in which you would um, evaluate this result is you would look at the relative abundance of a given barcode at the end of the experiment and you would normalize that uh, by the relative abundance of the barcode at the beginning of the experiment, since when you prepare a CRISPR library, it's uh, usually pretty heterogeneous in terms of its initial representation. Um, and this is what you would call a, a log fold change. And this gives you a sense of, um, you know, if, if uh, log fold change is negative, then the cell is, or the barcode is less abundant at the end of the experiment, indicating that that CRISPR reagent caused a, a depleting phenotype. There are some problems with just using log fold change. Um, so uh, as we've become more familiar with CRISPR data over the years, it's become clear that there are biases to this data as there, there are in, in any biological experiment, um, but there are some that are particularly noteworthy in CRISPR. One of the famous problems with CRISPR data um, in this kind of experiment is what's called the copy number effect. So um, you have, uh, if you have a, a case where you have a highly amplified region, um, as is common in, in cancer, um, in the genome, and you target that with a CRISPR reagent, then you wind up having this nonspecific toxicity that doesn't really seem to be at all related to um, any functional capacity of the region. It shows up even if you target an intergenic region that happens to be uh, amplified a lot. Um, and it's probably just related to the CAS protein cutting repeatedly the, the genome, which cells don't like. There's also uh, incomplete penetrance, I guess, would be one way of thinking about this. So uh, with a drug experiment, you know, you know that within a cell, a drug is not perfectly effective at ablating uh, a protein's function. Um, but you can have, you can reasonably infer that cells have more or less uniform exposure to the drug. And so it's, you know, doing more or less the same thing. If you have the, you know, a genetically identical cells doing the same thing in every cell. Uh, 
With CRISPR, that's not the case. Um, it's a highly stochastic process. We're basically just cutting the genome and hoping that uh, the repair uh, fails in such a way that we generate a loss of function, for example, by generating a frame shift. And that's sort of random um, per cell, but it's also uh, your likelihood of achieving that depends a lot on your guide design. Um, and so you have this sort of random effect per guide and that some guides are more effective than others um, at causing loss of function. There are off-target effects. Um, and in, in this bucket, I also put clonal outgrowth. So you have these sort of um, uh, highly sparse, um, but strong weird effects that show up in CRISPR data. Um, one of those is that you might have a, a guide that um, is actually causing loss of function in a gene you didn't mean to target. And uh, so this will show up as, as the guide uh, randomly producing a very strong depletion, um, even though the other guides targeting the same gene do not. Um, and you have the opposite effect where sometimes a single guide, um, maybe in just one biological replicate of a cell line, um, will become highly amplified or, or become very abundant at the end of the experiment. And of course, it could be that this guide itself somehow caused a huge gain of fitness for, for the cell. And maybe if you target a tumor suppressor like P53, that's the case. Um, but often this just shows up for one of the guides targeting a gene out of maybe four guides that you have. And it's probably just a kind of jackpotting effect where there has been some sort of incidental gain of fitness um, driving a clonal expansion, but it might not be related to your guide or even the CRISPR perturbation at all. Um, then when you are looking across CRISPR screens, which is what we're very interested in DepMap, the whole point of Project Achilles is to enable us to look across um, thousands now at, at this point, we're up, we're up to thousands of um, cell lines and, and see how see the patterns of dependency across them. Uh, there's a problem in that um, some cell lines just show uh, more or less signal when, uh, when you conduct a CRISPR experiment. And then um, also if you're just using log full change, of course, the log of a very small number is a very large negative value. And so the difference between having zero or one count for a particular guide at the end of the experiment um, is just statistically not that meaningful, but it shows up as a huge change in, in uh, log fold change. So these are some of the challenges with CRISPR data. Of course, there are a bunch of existing methods that sort of address subsets of these um, challenges. Um, but what we're hoping for with, with Kronos and part of the motivation for it um, is to try and, and address these um, more or less all together in one package. So the way in which it, it does this, or, or at least sort of what the core model is that Kronos uses, as I said, you know, you have the sort of stochastic effect when you're uh, conducting a CRISPR screen and that you have some cells that achieve knockout and some that don't. Um, and uh, you have a range of effects in between, right? So you might have a, a homozygous loss of function or um, you might have a uh, ablation of function that still leaves part of the protein function intact. But we're gonna, in Kronos, uh, simplify this to a binary choice of either a cell has intact gene function or it does not have intact gene function after you infect with a guide. So on the left, you, uh, if we just pick out one guide um, out of the, the pool we're infecting with to follow and, and we look at how it behaves in cells, um, you have this bifurcation of uh, sort of uh, outcomes that occur. And if this is a guide that's targeting a gene that's maybe um, essential for cell survival, um, you can see that in cells on the bottom where we fail to actually knock out the gene in question, they'll continue uh, to, um, uh, cell cycle and, and continue to grow um, at more or less the original cell growth rate. So that's what I'm calling capital RC. So at every subsequent time point, um, this population of cells will actually have continued to grow in size, while the population of cells where you did achieve the knockout uh, will shrink over time and, you know, eventually completely exit the experiment. And so if you run the experiment long enough, actually the barcodes that you'll count for this guide at the end will all be arising from cells where you failed to make uh, the effective perturbation you wanted at all. Um, and in every previous time point, what you'll be reading out is a, a mix of these two cell populations. And as the experimenter, you have no indication of what that mixture is. You don't know uh, what proportion of cells you actually achieve the phenotype you want. Um, so at Kronos, does or, or um, attempts to do is 
to uh, actually infer both this mix of populations. So per guide and per cell line, um, it tries to infer the relative abundance of uh, success versus non-success in knocking out your gene. And simultaneously to infer uh, what the relative change of growth rate is when you do succeed in knocking out the gene in question. And that's this uh, red R, little R sub CG, um, which we'll call the gene effect for Kronos. So um, for any method that's analyzing so the read counter log pull change data coming from a, a CRISPR experiment, you're looking to generate a sort of a, a gene by cell line or a gene by model matrix of, of estimates of gene effect, which you can actually do um, all the interesting um, downstream analyses that you would want to. Josh, before you go on, I just want to voice a question that was posted by audience member Ben. Um, and the question is this, um, are some of the issues that you're describing mitigated in CRISPR-I um, when, when you use that instead of CRISPR to introduce double strand breaks? Yeah, um, so it's probable that the copy number effect is mitigated, although I actually don't know about um, data to that effect. And I think that actually, um, in some sense, the, the simple picture I've, I've presented of copy number effects is, is misleading. Um, and in fact, there's, there's sort of two versions of the copy number effect and one of them gets worse in CRISPR-I um, from the, from the uh, sort of brief look into it that we did in depth map. Um, so that kind of pushed us uh, in the direction of not uh, pursuing it. Um, related to that, there's an issue with CRISPR-I that uh, it's very difficult to adequately suppress amplified regions at all to suppress the function of amplified genes. Um, and so that's a downside. Many of the other effects I think are going to be the same. So you're still going to have variable screen quality. You're still going to have um, stochasticity in terms of whether you or not you succeed in um, ablating a gene's function. So where I think CRISPR-I is very useful is that it's tunable. Um, so you can generate a, a, pars a sort of intermediate partial loss of, of function um, by designing your guide correctly. There was an interesting paper that came out a couple of years ago about that. Um, but I don't actually think that it's going to get you out of having to think carefully about the biases of, of CRISPR data. It may just shift which biases you have to consider. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions uh, before I move on? Because this is sort of the end. Of I don't the, see any uh, posted, um, but I will remind the audience that, oh, um, yes, I, I don't see, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Um, ben says, thank you for, for your response. I don't see any other questions at the moment. So. All right, I'll continue. Um, so specifically, the goal of Kronos is to um, infer a, a probability per cell line of achieving knockout. So there's a value that seems to vary per cell line that corresponds to screen quality. Um, that sort of determines overall whether you're knocking out genes successfully with CRISPR in that cell line at all or, or not. And maybe that's related to how active your CAS protein is in that cell line, or maybe it's related to other things. Um, it also looks, it also tries to estimate per guide um, how effective that guide is at achieving knockout in the given gene. It tries to estimate the um, relative growth rate of the cell line if, if there are no CRISPR perturbations. And then critically, of course, this gene fitness effect, which is the change in relative growth rate. Um, and it does all this while it's trying to maximize the likelihood of the observed read counts under a negative binomial model. Um, and so this gets around a bit this issue with having, you know, with correctly interpreting very small read counts, which are distorted when you take a, a log fold change. The workflow for using Protos, um, the, you need a minimum of three things. You need a, a matrix of read counts. Um, you need a map of the rows of that matrix to either models or cell lines or, or PDNA measurements. Um, and you need a map of the columns of that matrix to genes. So the columns of the matrix represent, each column represents an SGRNA, uh, an SGRNA and each of the rows represents a, a, a biological replicate or um, a sequence of PDNA or something of that nature. And you pass these two things into to Kronos. And uh, one of the things that Kronos can do uh, has a function for is, is removing these clonal outgrowths. So it can detect uh, things that, that look very strange. These are strange, highly abundant values, and it will just um, NA them. Then it infers all these parameters I described, including crucially the, the gene effect. Um, and then if you have a copy number available, um, it can then correct for uh, copy number bias. 
And um, obviously, as, as I showed a few slides ago, there's a bunch of methods that already exist. And we picked uh, sort of the three uh, major, most, most commonly used ones um, to compare Kronos with. So there's Sirius, which is what the depth map has been using, um, which just uh, corrects for the copy number effect and for guide efficacy. Um, and has some nice features uh, when you have uh, many cell lines. In fact, it can only be run with, with multiple cell lines, um, but has some, some features to improve the data in that, in that setting. Um, and is in some ways the most similar, I think, to Kronos. Uh, there's Magic MLE, um, which is the only other model I know of which actually uh, correctly uses uh, recount statistics um, <clears throat> and is a very popular one for use in sort of individual uh screens that that might be done in individual labs and then uh sanger the sanger institute uh has a data set very similar in nature to the project achilles data set many cell lines genome-wide knockout um, and they use bagel um and together with a separate copy number correction method and so that's the other point of comparison and we uh looked initially at just uh the project achilles and um Sanger's project score, large CRISPR data sets, and on the right is the uh, abundance of, of cell lines that belong to different types of cancer that are present in, in the data. A fair number of them overlap with both. So one of the, the first things you're going to want to look at, um, and sort of the most natural thing to look at when you're trying to figure out um, how well you're doing both in an experiment and how well you're doing at analyzing the experiment is, is how separated are my control groups. And for control groups here, we just used uh, for negative controls genes that are unexpressed in the cell line in question. Um, and of course, you have a very strong prior that if a gene isn't expressed before you uh, try to knock it out with CRISPR, then knocking it out with CRISPR should not have a, a viability phenotype. And you know, if you if you see one, then that's an indication of a quality problem in your screen. And then um, there are a bunch of genes that have been, um, you know, we have, we have high confidence that they should be essential in more or less every uh, human cell based on um, orthogonal data. Um, and uh, so those we can use as, as positive controls. And you can see here for the two data sets on the top and bottom row with each method, what the separation of those two looks like. So I'll just note a couple qualitative features about Kronos. So you can see on the right um, that the negative controls are, are more sharply peaked. Um, they're more of a spike close to zero, which is what we want to see because we think the true answer is that these values should all be identically zero uh, for unexpressed genes. And then um, you can also notice that there's more of this sort of elongated uh, slab or wedge-like um, shape for the positive controls. And that also corresponds to kind of our intuition about the biology of, of essential genes and that there's the spread of effect. Um, some genes just um, may halt cell growth and other genes may, if you knock them out, lead to rapid cell death. Uh, but that's just a sort of quantitative description. The, um, or a qualitative description. Um, so we evaluated quantitatively how good each model is at, at separating controls using a, a few different metrics. Um, the first metric is, <coughs> sort of the workhorse QC method we use in, in Project Achilles. Um, we use this to decide whether to release a screen at all or, or whether it failed um, QC altogether. Um, and it's very simple. You just take the median of the positive controls, you subtract the median of the negative controls, so you get that distance, and then you normalize by the width of the negative control distribution. So this, this uh, rewards you for having um, very depleted positive controls and punishes you for having a, a widespread um, in your negative control distribution. And the result for that is um, if you um, look either at individual cell lines or you just pool everything together and, and look overall, Kronos uh, 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 clearly has the best um, separation by this metric. Um, however, it's not the only way you could uh, decide um, to evaluate your CRISPR screens. And uh, you might decide that you care not so much about sort of this sort of broad uh, separation of these two distributions. You might really care about um, how many false positives am I getting? Um, and this is a measure that relates directly to sort of how many of these unexpressed um, genes are winding up to be highly depleted, regardless of maybe most of your genes are, are nicely peaked, but maybe you have a long tail of stuff that is scoring that shouldn't. And that sort of reflects a off-target problem. Um, so what we found with uh, 
modeling in, in these CRISPR experiments in, in Project Achilles is that consistently about 15% of the genome in a given cell line um, has a genuine negative viability phenotype. And there is a very interesting sort of live and, and perhaps a little controversial question about why this is the case. Why is, why is only 15% of the genome apparently necessary uh, for cell uh, proliferation or, or survival um, and, and the rest of it is, is not, and is this maybe just because we're only knocking down one gene at a time? Um, it's an, it's an interesting and ongoing question. Um, but anyway, that, that's how we choose the 15% threshold for calling something a, a hit, um, uh, just for this, this simple analysis. And so we just count up the number of unexpressed genes that are falling in the bottom 15% of, of genes in this, in these genome-wide experiments. Um, and so lower is better. And uh, you can see that, that Kronos has, um, uh, Kronos scores the best in terms of having the fewest false positives um, in both of these experiments. And the difference is, is um, although it's small between Kronos and Ceres for Project Achilles, um, it's, it's highly significant in all cases because there's so many data points informing these analyses. Then the last control separation metric you might be interested in um, is the precision recall. So um, related to the, the previous metric, but we're asking how many of the known common essential scores can we recover at a given precision? And we're using the unexpressed gene scores uh, to determine what our precision is. And um, what we find here is that it's kind of a wash between Kronos and Ceres, although both are clearly better than either uh, Bagel or Magic. Um, it, depending on exactly which metric you choose um, or which data set you're looking at, a, you know whether Kronos or, or Ceres uh, wins by this metric it, uh, varies. Um, so this is, uh, we both look at the area under the whole precision recall curve, and we also look at how many common essentials you can recover at 90% precision. The thing about all these, um, uh, global controls I'm that I spoke of, these common essentials versus unexpressed genes, is that they're not actually the genes that we're generally interested in, um, certainly not for, for cancer therapy. We're, we're interested in genes that are only necessary for subsets of cell lines, um, because these are potentially interesting therapeutic targets, um, in particular if, it, if they're uh, being driven by some cancer alteration and that's what drives the dependency, that's quite interesting. But also if, um, you know, they, they might be dependencies for a, a lineage of cells that um, is dispensable and they could still be um, potential cancer therapeutic targets. In any case, it's the variation across cell lines that really informs us about the gene biology and lets us figure out sort of functional relationships between genes. So this is much harder to evaluate um, because there's uh, much less solid ground truth here. Um, but there are a few pieces we can use um, uh, a few sets of genes that we know should be dependent in certain contexts. So one example is um, OncoKB curates a set of oncogenes, um, which are thought to drive cancer um, given a, a particular alteration. Um, and so we treated these as positive controls in the cell lines in which that alteration is present. An example would be uh, BRAF. Uh, BRAF mutation drives uh, many melanomas. Um, and so if you have uh, one of the uh, BRAF gain of function mutations, we expect that knocking out BRAF will be uh, deleterious for, for cell survival or cell proliferation. Um, so BRAF is a positive control in cell lines where uh, you have that BRAF alteration and then it's a negative control in cell lines where you don't. Um, and we can evaluate sort of how well those, those controls, um, th those two groups of cell lines separate on a per gene basis. And it's just, Pure statistical noise if you do that, um, because uh, most of these genes, we only have maybe one or two cell lines that have um, any of the indicated alterations. Um, but you can pool across genes, you can pool all the scores for the cell lines where they're supposed to be dependent. You just lump all those together for, across all genes, and then you um, lump all the scores for the cell lines where the genes aren't supposed to be dependent. Um, and then you can get uh, um, a more, uh, a, a less noisy version on the bottom. Um, and Kronos was uh, significantly better than its competitors in the context of Project Achilles. Um, in the context of Project Score, the best uh, performing model was actually 
angle too, which was a little surprising, but um, it's also none of these differences are significant in the project score data um, since it's a smaller and noisier data set. Um, and then the, you get a sort of similar result if you look at the um, area under the precision recall curve. You can also look at um, a less uh, literature dependent um, set of uh, selective dependencies. So many genes are dependent in cell lines in which they're overexpressed, uh, which is, uh, you know, I, I think a fairly intuitive and plausible relationship. Um, this is particularly true of many transcription factors. And so we took the set of genes um, that have been previously found in RNAi experiments um, to uh, appear to be dependencies when they're overexpressed. And we look for those genes to be negatively correlated with their gene effect because a negative uh, gene effect uh, indicates depletion. And so when expression goes up, we expect uh, the cell line to be more depleted as you knock out that gene. And um, again, uh, it's sort of, um, it's, it's pretty similar with all methods. Um, so I'll just say sort of globally that uh, you're not going to see huge or, or sort of gross changes um, in the CRISPR gene effect that uh, you infer with any of these methods um, because they're all working with the same underlying data. And so your gains are kind of um, sort of at the margins. Um, but uh, we found that uh, Kronos, again, was, was the best performing method in terms of recovering um, expression addiction. So what the interpreting this plot, um, you pick a threshold and you ask how many expression addictions have at least that strong a correlation. Um, and uh, just count. And of course, as you relax your threshold, you recover more and more of the expression addictions. And um, consistently, Kronos recovers more than its competitors. So those were all results um, if you're just using the Project Achilles uh, project score data set. So these all consist of many cell lines, but read out at only one late time point. But Kronos is a dynamic model. Um, and it's actually designed uh, to exploit um, cases where you might have readouts of multiple time points. And this is uh, becoming a little more common in CRISPR experiments and I expect it will continue to become even more common uh, in part because the cost of sequencing continues to fall at a really dramatic rate. Um, and so it becomes a relatively small proportion of the cost of running a CRISPR screen to just get sequencing at, at different time points along the course of the experiment. Um, and um, it's also just uh, sort of, of, of key interest when you're deciding if something is an interesting therapeutic target, uh, something that produces a, a very rapid phenotype uh, might just be a better candidate uh, for targeting with a drug than something that has a very slow phenotype. Um, and what Kronos can do is, is given multiple time points, it can kind of distinguish um, these two cases where you might have a gene that has a very strong phenotype right, but, but weak reagents um, in red. So something, so what happens with such a gene is that um, you'll initially see a rapid fall in the abundance of, of cells uh, when you try to knock out that gene. But because you have poor penetrance, because you have, you have low quality reagents, there are many cells where you didn't successfully bleed the gene function. And so you'll saturate at a fairly high value because you'll have killed off all the cells where you knocked out the gene and you'll just be left with a large, residual population where you failed to, to knock out the gene. Um, and then you can also have the opposite case where you have a weak phenotype, but you have very high quality reagents. And you could see, depending on, on which time point you choose to halt the experiment and do a readout at, um, you would get very different answers as to which of these was, was the stronger gene. Um, so uh, to uh, be able to correctly um, uh, disambiguate um, these two cases, uh, Kronos can use multiple time points. Um, so a couple examples from, from real genes um, in Project Achilles. Um, here's what, what the data would look like for different reagents over time. So uh, Polar 2L is a nice example of a gene that has a very strong depleting phenotype. It's, it's highly necessary for cell survival. Uh, and in the Avana library, you can see that there's um, one guide that actually uh, didn't perform, although there are three guides that perform quite well. And, and these uh, lines are sort of Kronos's inference about um, what the uh, guide abundance should be should have been at a, at a given time point. And you can see the actual uh, distribution of data in the points. And then there's an example on the right of TSEN2, which is a gene that causes a weak uh, depleting phenotype. Um, 
in, in those cells. Um, and you can see here again, there's also a, a variation in terms of the reagent quality, but you can also see how you get the sort of slow, even for the good reagents, you get the sort of slow um, dropout of, of cells. And in fact, although this experiment ended at 25 days, um, they still probably haven't saturated the depletion that you could observe for, for DSEM2. So given that you have this data available, um, we tried running Kronos um, and the other models minus series because this uh, uh, longitudinal data only had one uh, cell line in it. So series actually couldn't be run at all. Um, and we tried seeing what happens when you include more and more late time points. And here for a given value, so uh, when we only include one time point, um, these uh, shaded regions are sort of the 90% confidence interval um, where you have this sort of distribution that's generated based on which time point you chose to include. So you could include day seven or day 10 or day 13 or 16 or 18 or 21 or 24. Um, and you get a uh, sort of different performance based on which time point you included. And then you could also include, uh, you know, a random collection of two time points and get a different distribution and so on. And these curves um, for uh, MAGIC MLE and BAGEL2, um, the only way in which you could combine multiple time points is to run separately on the, the time points and then just average them. Um, but for Kronos, you have the choice of either running separately and, and averaging, or you could run them together using that dynamic model to sort of integrate that time point information. And we wanted to see if there was really a benefit to do it using the uh, dynamic model of Kronos. And indeed there is, you can see, um, of course we only have one time point, there's no difference between those two. But as you go on, um, you can see you get better and better control separation um, you know, with all models, but uh, far more strikingly with uh, a joint run of Kronos than with any of the alternatives, including running Kronos individually on time points and averaging the result. So you get per better for performance overall um, regardless because you have more data. So you're sort of denoising your results, but you also um, definitely are getting something in addition by having uh, multiple time points with a dynamic model. Um, it's also important to look not just at the comparison between these lines, but also note um, how much your performance improves with Kronos versus Kronos with just one time point. Um, so uh, there's definitely benefits to having uh, multiple time points measured in the screen. And you can evaluate the separation also with, with the other metrics and we get a, a similar result in that by the time you have three, uh, three late time points by any metric um, running Kronos jointly uh, with those time points is is definitely a, a superior uh, version of the data. So then I'll turn to uh, the copy number effect. Um, so this actually will get back to uh, Ben's question from earlier. Um, so there are actually, as I, as I was saying earlier, two different versions of the copy number effect. Um, so the one that sort of everyone knows about is the one where, uh, you know, as I described, you target um, a non-essential gene or an intergenic region or whatever, and it happens to be highly amplified, um, then you'll get more depletion. And this leads to a negative correlation uh, between uh, gene effect and, and copy number um, for all the non-essential genes. Um, so more amplified, more negative gene score. Um, the complication here is that for a gene that um, is essential, you actually get the opposite correlation. So uh, more amplified regions, uh, you get higher gene effect score. And this uh, correlation, um, the, the sort of bifurcated uh, copy number effect uh, obviously complicates our efforts to correct it. Um, and it's also, I, I wanna say this, this um, effect on the left uh, kind of goes away with a CRISPR I um, type model, or at least is greatly reduced. But this effect on the right becomes much worse with, with CRISPR I. So that's one of the reasons I would say that CRISPR I is not sort of a, a slam dunk solution to the problem. Um, and actually, if you, if you look at how the copy number effect um, varies with, uh, with the actual copy number, here on the x axis, the copy number is um, this is uh, log two of, of uh, relative copy number. So one would be. Um, would be normal ploidy. Um, you could see that uh, the picture gets even more complicated. So um, non-essential genes, as you increase the copy number, as you would expect, they get more and more depleted. 
Um, common essential genes, um, this is normalized so that um, the average effect of the gene is, is zero, even though actually the average effect of the gene would be pretty negative. But um, if you uh, if you happen to have fewer copies, um, then you actually sensitize to a CRISPR knockout. Um, and then there's this inflection point at something like uh, a doubling of copy number. Um, and then at, at that point, after that, as you increase the number of copies, um, you actually increase depletion of the um, essential gene. So this is a fairly complicated behavior. And what it points to is that we need to correct copy number um, in a way that takes into account both the number of copies of a gene in a cell line, but also how essential that gene is across cell lines um, in order to simultaneously fix both of these effects. And so um, <clears throat> here's what the relationship of, of gene um, dependency effects uh, versus um, their own copy number looks like. So on the y-axis here, it's the Pearson correlation between um, a gene's gene effect and its own copy number. And then I've been the genes according to their average um, gene effect across cell lines. So more negative um, results here indicate a stronger common essential gene. Um, and you can see that um, for series, for example, um, it's actually pretty successful at removing the copy number effect that we uh, normally think of uh, with CRISPR in the sense that uh, the genes that aren't common essential um, aren't uh, negatively correlated with their own copy number, uh, more or less, but at a cost of actually amplifying um, this other sort of artifactual signal where genes that are um, common essential become more and more positively correlated with their own copy number. Um, and then CCR and, and MAGIC, you get sort of lesser versions of the same effect. And then um, for Kronos, actually very successfully uh, remove this sort of net signal um, where all genes are, are um, uh, either positively or negatively correlated with their own copy number based on whether they are or are not common essential. Um, and it's still the case that uh, you can observe dependencies. Um, really, with any of these methods, you can observe um, that a... Uh, a gene that genuinely is um, a dependency for a cancer and also happens to be amplified, which, which is common, right? Um, cancer drivers are often amplified in cancer. Um, you could still observe that those are essential for um, that cancer survival, um, but you've removed sort of the artifactual signal of um, everything else that happened to be amplified along with that driver um, also showing up as a dependency. And then um, the last uh, major source of bias that I, I talked about at the beginning, which is not nearly so talked about with CRISPR as uh, the copy number effect, but I think is in some ways, um, depending on, on what exactly you're doing, it, it can be even more pernicious, um, is the screen quality effect. And the reason this can be uh, pernicious is because it's both in some ways less obvious in data um, than the copy number effect. It's less sparse. It's more broadly distributed among all your gene scores. As you get into more sensitive analyses, um, for example, as you're trying to find um, gene functional relationships by looking for genes that are um, depleted in similar contexts, um, this screen quality bias actually becomes uh, very important and very um, powerful um, in terms of uh, messing with your analysis. And the reason that happens is because in a good screen, um, every common essential gene um, and, and this includes genes that uh, both have very strong um, instant death phenotypes and, and genes that have sort of weak, um, you know, growth inhibition phenotypes, uh, but they all become more or less depleted in tandem um, based on whether your screen is good or, or not. So in a good screen, they're all very depleted and in a bad screen, they're not, they're scarcely depleted at all. Um, so we're looking up at the top and bottom at the good and bad screen and, um, Series uh, actually mitigates this effect somewhat thanks to a, a regularization in the model that encourages gene scores to be uh, in every cell line to be closer to the, uh, the average. Um, but Kronos, because it explicitly models um, factors that drive uh, screen quality, like um, the cell growth rate and the um, probability of achieving um, effective knockout of genes in a cell line, um, is able to align this data very nicely um, pretty close to the diagonal. So you don't see this big trend that's different between um, good and bad screens. 
Of course, there will always be individual genes that score or don't score in individual cell lines. That's the point. Um, but you don't want this massive trend where every common essential is more or less depleted and, and Kronos helps resolve that. Um, of course, you could try to resolve this for other methods or manually um, by just rescaling the data. And this is what we were doing in DepMap before. Um, so you can just, uh, for a, a bad screen, you might um, just amplify all your results so that um, the median of your uh, common essential still falls on the diagonal just because you've multiplied every everything in that cell line by a fixed value. Um, but the problem with this is that when you do that, you amplify the noise in the cell line. Um, and for a poor quality screen, you might amplify the noise quite a lot. Um, the, this width of the noise distribution before and after scaling um, is, is illustrated at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's not an optimal approach to fixing the problem. And then the, the last topic um, to cover um, is, so what's changed in, in depth map data? If you consume um, the depth map data, of course, this will be of interest to you. If you don't consume the, the depth map data, um, it might be um, of less immediate interest, but it, it might still be um, sort of interesting to understand uh, sort of what you can get and what you can't get by choosing different models for uh, CRISPR experiments. Um, so the, the gene score distribution, as we mentioned before, is that, uh, you know, Kronos has more of a spike of non-essentials um, versus versus series, so it, it's more tightly peaked near zero. Um, that's uh, you know a fairly minor difference in terms of analysis. Um, but what's more important is that most gene profiles um, are going to correlate pretty well with each other, um, really regardless of which method you run. But here we're looking specifically at, at Kronos and series, so it, it's not the case that you're going to choose a different model for your CRISPR data. Um, and for most genes, you see, you know, some sort of dramatic difference in terms of, of your outcome, right? Every model is relying on the same underlying um, read counts. And if they're doing reasonable things with those read counts, you shouldn't see this enormous change for, for many genes in terms of um, what you're actually uh, inferring for, for the gene effect profile. But if you do look at the gene effect profile across cell lines, um, and this is specifically in Achilles, um, you can see that um, for genes that have a, sort of a more negative mean effect, meaning common essentials, um, they're on average less correlated uh, between Kronos and, and series models versus genes that um, are uh, not uh, common essentials, which have a, you know a, an average correlation of about 0.9. Um, these genes vary for all the reasons we, we discussed earlier. Kronos um, is, is treating cases of very low read counts, which is often what you see with, with common essential genes differently than series is. Series takes log volt change. Kronos actually looks at the read count data. Um, and Kronos also has uh, this intrinsic um, ability to model screen quality. Um, and that has a strong influence on the pattern that you see with common essentials. But if you throw out all these uh, common essential scores, um, and just focus on the remaining genes that are poorly correlated. Um, you can, oh, sorry. Um, the, the other thing I should mention is that um, uh, for the reason common essentials are different is that um, there's also this sort of uh, cutoff uh, for Kronos, right? Because Kronos recognizes that you can't have, you know, you can't be more dead than dead. Um, you can't have fewer than zero read counts. And so you have kind of cut off on in terms of what Kronos will infer for a negative gene effect. For series, you have this very long tail um, where you can get extreme negative gene effects for a given gene. Um, this is for the RAN gene, um, just based on sort of the um, how the log fold change happened to look based on um, sort of the, the total number of read counts you had and, and what kind of pseudo count uh, method you employed and other sort of statistical choices. Um, so that's that's another difference in terms of how they treat common essentials. Um, but if you look at the genes that, that are left, um, there are some cases where you have low correlation because there's just no signal in the genes. So the genes don't correlate because they all have more or less the same value across all cell lines. Um, most of the time, this is because they, you know, they actually aren't having an effect or you just had totally ineffective reagents in the library. And but either way, there's, there's nothing to learn or to model. Um, so those you won't get great correlation because there's, there's just no signal. Um, and you can also um, throw those out along with, with the common essentials. And then the remaining genes um, where you really get big differences are uh, genes where you have reagent disagreement. So here's one example of that. Um, you can see that uh, for TCAL7, 
you have uh, a bunch of guides that show no depletion on the y-axis is the average guide level log fold change um, for guides targeting the stream. And then you have one guide that shows a, a strong depletion. And so you're going to get very different answers for um, how important TCEAL7 TCE is for uh, cell survival based on whether you believe the four guides that don't show depletion or the one guide that does. Series actually has this problem where it tends to believe the most extreme guide um, because it can say, well, the other guides were just ineffective reagents. Um, so I'm going to fit the data to this one guide that does show depletion, and I'll explain the difference with the rest by saying that they were just ineffective. Um, Kronos, we explicitly designed so that it cannot do this. Um, and so for this gene, Kronos believes the uh, other four reagents, um, and its gene effect is, is driven by um, those reagents and not this uh, outlier highly depleted reagent. Um, and this, this highly depleting reagent, it could be off target. Um, or it could be something that for some reason you have a bad estimate of its initial abundance in your, your cell pool. Um, but either one of those effects are not something you really want influencing your, your gene effect estimate. Um, and we're pretty confident in this case that Kronos uh, chose the correct solution because this gene is actually unexpressed in most cell lines. Um, and so you can see for Kronos, uh, the scores are nicely centered at zero, but for, but for series, um, most of the cell lines look like they actually have some dependence on this gene. So um, broadly, if we, if we look beyond this example, um, most of the remaining causes of disagreement or most of the remaining genes that disagree do seem to have this kind of reagent level conflict. And some of them are cases where um, it really is driven by just one guide and series has picked that one, one outlier guide to believe. And that's what we're calling series one um, sgRNA genes. Um, and in other cases, it might be a pair of guides um, that point in one direction, a pair of guides point in the opposite direction. And then, you know, which one your model chooses to believe is mostly a matter of, of chance. And there's no way um, for any model to consistently pick the right one. Um, but those cases are, are relatively rare. So it's relatively few genes where you don't have very strong correlation, um, regardless of, of the model you choose. So um, uh, when you're looking between Kronos and series, uh, of course, uh, genes that have uh, very little signal are not going to be correlated. Genes that are common essential are going to look pretty different um, because of just the, the different treatments of copy number effect, the statistics, and, and uh, the um, screen quality um, effects. Um, and uh, in general, uh, we prefer the uh, Kronos inference for common essentials um, because we think it's, it's doing a better job of correcting for the various biases for these types of genes. Um, and then exceptions are usually being driven by guide level data. In cases where you have sort of multiple reagents pointing to one solution and multiple reagents point to the other solution, you're just kind of screwed. You're, you just can't have much confidence in your, your gene results. Um, but there are cases where you'll just have one outlying guide, and we think that Kronos handles those cases more reasonably by not sort of pursuing that one outlying guide and leaving the other guides instead. So, <clears throat> um, but overall, um, you know, running Kronos versus any other method doesn't change a huge amount about the, the data, um, unless you have, um, of course, multiple time points, and then um, you get stronger differences in terms of uh, the gene effect matrices by running Kronos versus other methods. Um, it is suitable for running on, on most CRISPR experiments. Um, whether or not you have, you might have multiple libraries that you want to integrate, Kronos does actually uh, accommodate that currently. Um, and there's, a, you can run it if you only have one cell line or if you have many cell lines, if you only have one late time point in your experiment or if you measure many late time points. Um, it should not be used for RNAi data, data because it's uh, making assumptions that are just incompatible with the way RNAi experiments work. Um, so if you have an shRNA or an RNAi experiment, um, I strongly recommend looking into Demeter 2. Um, and then uh, you also have to have a um, either a pDNA abundance estimate or or some very early time point post infection. We have you have to have some way of knowing um, how many cells there are for each. Uh, guide at the beginning of the experiment. Um, and then given only one time point, Kronos still um, will outperform most competitors uh, uh, on most metrics that we evaluated. And then um, it gets rapidly much better um, if you add additional time points. 
Uh, it's available now um, it, on GitHub. Um, it's not currently available as a command line tool. Um, it's designed to be run um, in a Python environment. So there is a vignette um, in there that's a Jupyter Notebook. If you have Jupyter Notebook and, and uh, Python installed, um, you can launch it and just run through an interactive uh, sort of tutorial of it um, using a, a much reduced version of the depth map data set. And um, I'd like to, to thank um, many people um, in CDS, in particular, James McFarland and, and Aviad Cherniak, who both mentored me as I was uh, working on this project. Um, and then depth map leadership, including uh, Francesca uh, Vasquez, Jesse Bohm, um, who's now left depth map, but, but um, was, you know, is, is, was essential um, during this, this project. Um, David Root, who's the director of GPP, um, and uh, Bill Hahn, and then uh, all the other members of my group who all provided um, much useful commentary as I was working on this project. Thanks so much, Josh, for a really clear and, and thought-provoking talk. Um, uh, ben has posted another question that I will read, um, which is, first of all, thanks again for the really interesting primer. And the question is, is Kronos relevant to perturb seek data as well? So Kronos is a, um, it, it just works on viability phenotypes. Um, perturb seek, uh, you know, what you're interested in, you might be interested in just trying to have some sort of intermediate model that uh, predicts viability, I guess, from the uh, changes in transcription. Um, but really, you'd probably be interested in a model that's, you know, oriented around the much richer, um, you know, much larger phenotype readout that you're getting from uh, perturb seek. Um, so I wouldn't use Kronos for that. And then, um, I don't see any other posted questions. I have just one, which is in terms of workflow, if, if a, an experimenter or researcher has, has um, applied CRISPR and not thought about some of these biases before the experiment, um, am I correct in thinking that once they then start worrying about these things and find out about Kronos as a way to address some of these biases, they can do that without having planned a priori to, to run this? Is that so um, it, it can be done post facto basically, is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, the thing that you have to have to run Kronos is you have to have some either PDNA abundance or some early time point abundance. Um, so you know how many barcodes you had to start with in the experiment. And I think that's usually collected by most people, but there are you know some cases where, where people actually don't collect that. They just assume that the abundance is gonna be uniform at the start or something like that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, um, you don't have to have um, you don't have to have thought about anything really in advance. You can just run Kronos afterwards. That, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh, for the talk. I don't see any uh, additional questions. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and, and thought-provoking talk today. So thank you so much. All right, thank you.